Well, welcome, uh, everybody. Good of you to come out on a Saturday afternoon, especially a beautiful Saturday afternoon uh, like this. But I know why you've come out. You've come out to hear a, a terrific uh, speaker. Uh, Edward Fieser is a good man, as well as a brilliant one. Uh, he lives with his wife and six kids out in uh, Los Angeles. That's in California. You know, that can't be easy, right? Explaining why you got six kids all the time, can you imagine? Uh, Professor uh, Beezer teaches at Pasadena uh, City College. He's been a visiting uh, assistant professor at uh, Loyola Marymount University in the philosophy department there, and he's been a visiting scholar at the famous uh, Social Philosophy and Policy Center at Bowling Green uh, University in Ohio. He earned his PhD at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, with a thesis on uh, Russell and Hayek and the mind-body uh, problem. I just learned that in preparing this introduction. Now I'm going to try to figure out how to get hold of that thesis. Uh, of course, Professor Fieser is well known for his excellent uh, work uh, on Aquinas and Aristotle and on the broad tradition of natural law uh, theorizing, of which he's become a leading exponent. Uh, he's also well known, justly well known, uh, for his puncturing of the pretensions of so many of the uh, new atheists, including my dear old friend from New College, Oxford, with whom I have drunk many coffees and eaten many lunches. Uh, you know that guy, Richard Dawkins. Uh, if you haven't read uh, Professor uh, Beezer's book, Superstition, A Refutation of the New Atheism, uh, you really need to uh, do that not only because you'll learn a great deal, but because you'll just laugh from your belly at his uh, wonderful uh, uh, polemical, I use that not in a, in a pejorative sense at all, his wonderful polemical uh, writing. As I say, you also learn a great deal uh, from it. Uh, it's really a delight for me personally to welcome uh, Professor Fieser uh, to uh, Princeton. Uh, he got a double dose of intelligence when it was being handed out. But while um, I respect intelligence, I don't especially admire it. Uh, I admire toughness and bravery. And Professor Fieser got a triple dose of those virtues. And they are exactly the virtues that we, at this moment of our history, in this time, in this place, in this culture, in this country, so desperately need. So Professor Fieser, He's not only a terrific philosopher from whom we can learn, he's a role model that we all ought to be emulating. And with that, I take enormous pleasure in giving you Professor Edward Fieser. Thank you, Robbie, for that very uh, humbling, generous introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, I wish I'd really you know, actually now bother to write up a talk. It's uh, to live up. Okay, I'm joking, but uh, uh, very kind words. I appreciate that, and I uh, appreciate the invitation from the Hanscom Society as well to speak. So thank you very much. Um, the title of my talk is Natural Law and the Foundations of uh, Sexual Ethics, and as the first half of the talk indicates, the first half of the title, Natural Law, indicates what I have to say will be controversial, no doubt. The second half of the title, the fact that it's on sexual morality, though, indicates that at least it won't be boring, uh, I hope. And um, as an old professor I used to know like to say, if you can't instruct them, at least entertain them. Um, so uh, as Professor George noted in the last superstition, I try to do, try to do both, and hopefully I'll be able to do that uh, tonight. Uh, there should be a handout uh, given out. I trust everybody's got one. And um, if you don't have one, I'm sure they'll pass it to you. As you can see from the handout, my talk comes in two basic parts. The first part, which I've labeled the uh, teleology of sex here on the handout, is about the general um, natural law account, traditional natural law account of the, uh, of the purposes of sex. And then the second half of the talk is on something known as the perverted faculty argument, a, uh, a famous, some would say infamous or notorious, element of traditional natural law argumentation where sex, sexual morality is concerned, though I think that it's only properly understood in light of what I have to say in the first half of the talk on um, more natural law and the natural law approach to sex more generally. So we'll get to that, but after we lay some groundwork in the first half of the talk. Um, and I will be reading a paper here, forgive me. Uh, hope, hopefully that will 
not be too boring for people, but uh, I was at a conference recently. I noticed that the grad students who were presenting papers were all reading from tablets. And uh, it occurs to me, you can tell the difference between a grad student and a professor. When a grad student reads a paper, he reads it from a tablet. And when a uh, professor reads a paper, he reads it from paper. So I'll be uh, going old school tonight. Probably the next generation, that'll start to change. But I'll be reading from a paper here. So traditional natural law theory grounds morality in general and sexual morality in particular in human nature. The basic idea is that what is good for a thing is determined by the ends or purposes for the sake of which its natural faculties exist. For instance, the roots of a tree exist for the sake of providing the tree with nutrients and stability. To the extent that a tree grows strong and deep roots, it realizes these ends and thereby flourishes, and to the extent that it fails to realize these ends, it is defective and, and tends to atrophy. A squirrel by nature needs to hoard nuts for the winter. If it works to realize this and it will to that extent count as a good instance of a squirrel, whereas a squirrel which for whatever reason, brain, brain injury say, or a genetic defect, had no inclination to do so, would uh, to that extent be a bad and defective instance. Note that there's no naturalistic fallacy or illicit is ought inference in noting these biological facts, and neither is there such a fallacy in determining uh, what is good for human beings by reference to their nature. Human beings are no different from other living things in having characteristic faculties that exist for the sake of pursuing certain ends. Now, all sorts of questions might be raised about the implications of this view and about its philosophical foundations, which lie in Aristotelian metaphysics. I've addressed these questions in several uh, writings, and most thoroughly in a forthcoming essay from which this talk is extracted. Here I will simply provide a brief sketch of the approach to um, the traditional or old natural law theory as opposed to the new natural law theory of Germaine Grise, John Finnis, and Professor George, uh, takes towards issues of sexual morality. Now, when we apply traditional natural law theory to sexuality, the first step is to identify the natural end or ends of our sexual faculties. For if what is good for us is determined by what realizes the ends inherent in our nature, then what is good for us in the sexual context can only be what realizes the ends of our sexual faculties. For Aquinas and other natural law theorists who build on an Aristotelian metaphysical foundation, to be a human being is to be a rational animal. That we are animals of a sort entails that the vegetative, sensory, locomotive, and appetitive ends that determine what is good for non-human animals are also partially constitutive of our good. That we are rational entails that we also have as our own distinctive ends those associated with intellect and volition. Like other animals, in order to flourish, we must take in nutrients, go through a process of development from conception uh, through to maturity, reproduce ourselves, and move ourselves about in the world in response to inner drives and the information that we take in through sense organs. But on top of that, we have to exercise the rational capacities to form abstract concepts, put them together into judgments, and to reason from one judgment to another in accordance with the laws of logic. And we have to choose between alternative courses of action in light of what the intellect knows about them. Now, these latter higher rational activities do not merely constitute distinctive goods. They also alter the nature of the lower animal goods. For example, both a dog and a human being can have a visual perception of a tree. But there is a conceptual element, normal human visual perception, that is not present in the dog's perception. The dog perceives the tree, but not in a way that involves conceptualizing it as a tree, forming a judgment like that tree is an oak or inferring from the presence of the tree and the, and the tree's status as an oak, that an oak is present. In man, the animal's sensory element is fused to the distinctively human rational element in such a way as to form a seamless unity. Hence, while perception is a good for both non-human animals and human beings, that perception in our case participates in our rationality and makes of it uh, a different and indeed higher sort of good than that of which non-human animals are capable. Other goods we share in common with animals similarly participate in our rationality and are radically transformed as a result. Thus, meals have a social and cultural significance that raises them above mere feeding. Games have a social import and conceptual content that raises them up above the play of which other uh, mammals are capable, and so forth. Now, our sexual faculties are no different, and this is the key to understanding why they have a unitive as well as a procreative end and why these ends are inseparable. Take the latter first, the procreative end. That sex considered from a purely biological point of view exists for the sake of procreation is uncontroversial. I emphasize from a purely biological point of view, that part's uncontroversial. This is true even though people have sexual relations for various reasons other than procreation, 
since we're talking about nature's ends here, not ours. In particular, it is true even though sex is pleasurable and human beings and animals are typically drawn to sex precisely because of this pleasure. For giving pleasure is not the end of sex, not that for the sake of which sex exists in animals. Rather, sexual pleasure has its own, natu has its own natural end, the getting of animals to engage in sexual relations so that they will procreate. This parallels the situation with eating. Uh, even though eating is pleasurable, the biological point of eating is not to give pleasure, but rather to provide an organism with the nutrients that it needs to survive. The pleasure of eating is just nature's way of getting animals to do what is needed to fulfill this end. When analyzing the biological significance of either eating or sex, to emphasize pleasure would be to put the cart before the horse. Pleasure has its place, but it is secondary. <clears throat> Notice that nature also makes it very difficult to indulge in sex without procreation. There is no prophylactic sheath issued with a penis at birth, and no diaphragm issued with a vagina. I said it would get exciting, so don't try to control yourself. It <laughs> I need a sensor here. It takes some effort to come up with these devices, and even then, in the form in which they existed for most of human history, they were not terribly effective. Moreover, experience indicates that people simply find sexual relations more pleasurable when such devices are not used, even if they will often use them anyway out of a desire to avoid pregnancy. Indeed, this is one reason pregnancy is, even if often cut short by abortion, very common even in societies in which contraception is easily available. People know they could take a few minutes to go buy a condom, but go ahead and engage in unprotected sex anyway. As this indicates, sexual arousal occurs very frequently and can often be very hard to resist even for a short while. And that last resort to those seeking to avoid pregnancy, the withdrawal method, is notoriously unreliable. Even with the advent of the pill, pregnancies, though also abortions, are common. And even effective use of the pill, which has existed only for a very brief uh, period of human history, requires that a woman remember to take it at the appointed times and be willing to put up with its uncomfortable side effect. So, sex exists in animals for the sake of procreation, and sexual pleasure exists for the sake of getting them to indulge in sex so that they will procreate. And we're built in such a way that sexual arousal is hard to resist and occurs very frequently, and such that it is very difficult to avoid pregnancies resulting from indulgence of that arousal. The obvious conclusion is that the natural end of sex is, in part, not just procreation, but procreation in large numbers. Mother Nature clearly wants us to have babies and lots of them. Nor can this be written off as just so much rationalization of prejudice. Apart from the Aristotelian jargon, everything said so far about the natural ends of sex and sexual pleasure could be endorsed by the Darwinian naturalist as a perfectly accurate description of their biological functions, whether or not such a naturalist would agree with the moral conclusions that natural law theorists would draw from it. Now, in light of all this, it does seem that Mother Nature has put a fairly heavy burden on women, who, if nature takes its courts, are bound to become pregnant somewhat frequently. She has also put a fairly heavy burden on children, too, given that unlike non-human offspring, they are utterly dependent on others for their needs and for a very long period. This is true not only of their biological needs, but of the moral and cultural needs they have by virtue of being little rational animals. They need education in both what is useful and what is right, and correction of error. In human beings, procreation, that is to say generating new members of the species, is not just a matter of producing new organisms, but also of forming them into persons capable of fulfilling their nature as distinctively rational animals. So, nature's taking its course thus seems to leave mothers and offspring pretty helpless, or at any rate it would do so if there weren't someone ordained by nature to provide for them. But of course there is such a person, namely the father of the children. Fathers obviously have a strong incentive to look after their own children, rather than someone else's, and they're also, generally speaking, notoriously jealous of the affections of the women they have children with, sometimes to the point of being willing to kill the competition. Thus, Mother Nature very equitably puts a heavy burden on fathers, too, pushing them into a situation where they must devote their daily labors, providing for their children and the women, or woman or women, with whom they have had these children. And when nature takes its course, these children are bound to be somewhat numerous, so that the father's commitment is necessarily going to be long-term. Even considered merely from the point of view of its animal procreative aspects, then, and that's all we're talking about so far, the general teleology of sex points in the case of human beings in the direction of at least something like the institution of marriage. Here, too, nothing has been said that couldn't be endorsed by secular social scientists or evolutionary psychologists, whatever moral lessons they may or may not draw from uh, these facts. Now, that is the big picture view of the natural teleology of sex considered merely in its animal and procreative aspects. 
Let's turn now momentarily to the small picture, focusing on the sexual act itself. If we consider the structure of the sexual organs and the sexual act as a process beginning with arousal and ending in orgasm, it is clear that its biological function, its final cause, is to get semen into the vagina. That is why the penis and vagina are shaped the way they are, why the vagina secretes lubrication during sexual arousal and so forth. The organs fit together like lock and key. I decided not to use any visual aids for this <laughs> portion. <laughs> use your imagination, or don't use your, don't use your imagination. The, <laughs> the, the, point, <laughs> the point of the process is not just to get semen out of the male, but also into the female, and into one place in the female in particular. This too is something no one would deny when looking at things from a purely biological point of view whatever moral conclusions may or may not follow from it. Of course, there is more going on here than just plumbing. Women can have orgasms too. Sexual pleasure can be had by acts other than just vaginal penetration, and all sorts of complex and profound passions are aroused in a man and a woman during the process of lovemaking that go well beyond the simple desire to get semen into a certain place. But from the point of view of the animal procreative side of sex, all of this exists for the sake of getting men and women to engage in the sexual act, so that it will result in ejaculation of the vagina, and so that in turn offspring will be generated at least a certain percentage of the time that the act is performed, and so that father and mother will be strengthened in their desire to stay together, which circumstance is, whatever their personal intentions and thoughts, nature's way of sustaining that union upon which children depend for their material and spiritual well-being. Every link in this chain has procreation as its natural end, whatever the intentions of the actor. Again, when we're regarding it simply from the point of view of biology, So whatever else sex is, it is essentially procreative. If human beings did not procreate, then while they might form close emotional bonds with one another, maybe even exclusive ones, they would not have sex. That is to say, they would not be man and woman, as opposed to something asexual or androgynous. The claim is not that procreation entails sex. There is in the biological realm such a thing as asexual reproduction. Rather, the claim is that sex entails procreation in the sense that procreation is the reason sex exists in the first place, even if sex does not in every case result in procreation, and even if procreation could have occurred in some other way. Now, unlike other sexually reproducing animals, we know all of this about ourselves. We know that, qua male or female, each of us is in some unusual way incomplete. And that is why, in human beings, the procreative end of sex is by no means the end of the story. Human beings conceptualize their incompleteness and they idealize what they think will remedy it. It is important to note that this is as true of human sexuality in its most raw and animal as it is of its more refined manifestations. After all, dogs don't worry about the size of breasts and genitalia, nor do they dress each other up in garters and stockings, or in leather and leashes, for that matter. The latter are adornments, some perfectly innocent, some not, and they reflect an aesthetic attitude toward the object of desire of which non-rational animals are incapable. Animals also do not conceptualize the desires and perceptions of their sexual partners, as human beings do, even in the most immoral sexual encounters. Like the sexual organs, then, our sexual psychology is directed at, or points to, something beyond itself, and in particular, toward what alone can complete us, emotionally as well as uh, physiologically, given our nature. The human soul is directed to another soul, and not merely toward certain organs as its complement, man to woman and woman to man and that some people do not have a desire for the opposite sex, and in some cases lack sexual desire altogether, is as irrelevant to the natural end of our psychological faculties as, as the existence of club feet is telling us uh, what nature intends feet for. The nature of this psychological other-directedness is complex. In his chapter on romantic love in The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis usefully distinguishes what he calls Eros from Venus. Venus is sexual desire, which can be, even if it shouldn't be, felt for and satisfied by any number of people. Eros is the longing associated with being in love with someone, and no one other than that one person can satisfy it. Obviously, Venus can and very often does exist without Eros. Eros typically includes Venus, but it not only focuses Venus specifically on the object of romantic longing, but carries that longing to the point where Venus itself, along with everything else, might be sacrificed for the sake of the beloved if necessary. Sexual release is the object of Venus, but the beloved is the object of Eros. As Lewis wisely notes, it is an error to think that Venus without Eros is per se morally suspect. 
We might wish that every husband and wife felt for each other, as did Tristan and Isolde, or Romeo and Juliet, or Catherine and Heathcliff, or maybe not, given the tragic ends of these couples. Needless to say, real human life is rarely like that, and very frequently does not even rise to the level of a more sober approximation. Arranged marriages were common for much of human history. Modern marriages for love often lose their passion and settle into routine, or at least have their ups and downs, but without the disappearance of Venus. And some people simply do not have erotic temperaments, in the relevant sense, in the first place, but still have normal sexual desires and wish to marry. Eros is too unstable and outside our control to think that it is essential to the moral use of Venus. Sometimes mere affection, which, like Venus itself, can be felt for any number of people, has to suffice to civilize Venus. All the same, there is a reason that Eros is commonly regarded as an ideal, and is indeed often achieved, at least to some extent, even if passion inevitably cools somewhat. Like Venus, Eros is natural to us. It functions to channel the potentially unruly Venus in the monogamous constructive direction that the stability of the family requires. Of course, a respect for the moral law, fear of opprobrium, and sensitivity to the feelings of a spouse can do this too. But unlike Eros, the motivations they provide can all conflict with the agent's own inclination and are thus less efficacious. A decent person will confine the gratification of his or her sexual appetites to the marriage bed. But a person who is in love with his or her spouse wants to confine them to the marriage bed. Eros thus brings us out of ourselves more perfectly than Venus can, and thus raises Venus not only above the merely animal, but even above, the mere, even above mere rational self-interest. Venus and Eros, then, considered in terms of their natural function, might best be thought of not as distinct faculties, but as the opposite ends of a continuum. Venus tells us that we are incomplete, moving us toward that procreative action whose natural end, the generation of new human beings, requires the stability of mar marital union for its success. Eros focuses that desire onto a single person with whom such a union can be made and for whom the erotic lover happily forsakes all others and is even willing to sacrifice his own happiness. Eros is the perfection of Venus. Mere Venus is a deficient form of Eros. Human experience seems to confirm this insofar as it is the rare Lothario who does not at some point desire something more substantial, and the rare erotic lover who is willing entirely to forego Venus. Now, when we read all of this in light of the Aristotelian Thomistic metaphysics underlying traditional natural law theory, we're bound to draw some conclusions with, with which many today will not agree. First of all, the unit of end of sex builds on the procreative in just the way that the conceptual structure of human perceptual experience builds on the sensory element. That means that, as in the latter case, our rationality raises our animality to a higher level without in any way negating it. And here I turn to an analogy that I, I spell out there on the middle of the front page of the handout. A human visual experience is a seamless unity of the, of the rational and the animal. That we, unlike non-human animals, conceptualize what we perceive through sensation does not make a perception less than sensory, even if it makes it more than merely sensory. Similarly, the physiology of sexual arousal is, in human beings, associated with various complex other-directed psychological states, of which non-human animals are not capable. Um, and that fact does not make our sexual acts less than procreative in their natural end, even if they are more than merely procreative. A human sexual act is a seamless unity of the procreative and the unitive, directed at the same time toward both biological generation and emotional communion. Hence, there is no such thing as a sexual act which, of its nature, is merely unitive and in no way procreative, any more than there is such a thing as a human perceptual experience which, of its nature, is merely conceptual and in no way sensory. Of course, a particular sexual act may, in fact, be incapable of resulting in conception because the sexual organs have been damaged or worn out by age. But that no more changes what they and their activities are by nature than the fact that the visual apparatus might be damaged to the point of reducing the sensory content largely or even entirely, as in the neurological phenomenon known as blindsight, any more than that changes what visual perception is by nature, or any more than the fact that there are dogs which, due to injury, have fewer than four legs, shows that it is not the nature of a dog to have four legs. In all three cases, we have deviation from the norm expressed in what philosophers call an Aristotelian categorical statement. Quote, sexual acts are both unitive and procreative, that statement, is analogous to the statement that, quote, human visual perceptual experiences have both conceptual and sensory content, unquote, and to the statement that, quote, dogs have four legs. 
All three statements describe the paradigm or standard case. Nor is there any such thing as a sexual act which of its nature, as opposed to a particular individual uh, person's motivation, <clears throat> exists for the sake of pleasure alone and not for either the procreative or unitive end of sex. <clears throat> for as with the pleasure associated with the purely procreative sex of which animals are capable, the pleasure associated with human sexual relations exists for the sake of the natural ends of those relations. In this case, unitive as well as procreative, rather than for its own sake. It is precisely because sex involves the lovers taking intense pleasure in each other's bodies and in each other's most intimate feelings that it is capable of uniting them as it does. Without either the unitive or procreative ends, there would be no reason for nature to make sex pleasurable. And at least for the Aristotelian Thomistic metaphysician, nature does nothing in vain. Now, since the natural ends of our sexual capacities are simultaneously procreative and unitive, what is good for human beings vis-a-vis -vis those capacities is to use them only in a way that is consistent with these ends. This is a necessary truth given the background metaphysics, the Aristotelian Thomistic metaphysics of essentialism, final causality, and metaphysics of the good associated with that. It cannot possibly be good for us to use them in a way contrary to these ends, whether or not an individual person thinks that it is, any more than it can possibly be good for a diseased or damaged tree to fail to sink roots into the ground. This is true whatever the reason is for someone's desire to act in a way contrary to nature's purposes intellectual error, habituated vice, genetic defect, or whatever, and however strong that desire is. That a desire to act in such a way is very deeply entrenched in a person only shows that his will has become corrupted, or at least his inclination. A club foot is still a club foot and thus a defect, even though the person having it is not culpable for this and might not be able to change it. And a desire to do what is bad is still a desire to do what is bad, however difficult it might be for someone to desire otherwise. And whether or not the person is culpable, for having a tendency to form these desires, and he may not. What has been said so far clearly supports a general commendation of confining sexual activity to marriage and the having of large families, and a general condemnation of fornication, adultery, contraception, homosexual acts, bestiality, masturbation, pornography, and the like. If fornication threatens to bring children into the world outside of the marital context they need for their well-being. Adultery undermines the stability of that context, Contraceptive acts directly frustrate the procreative end of sex altogether. Homosexual acts and bestiality have no tendency toward procreation at all, and the emotions associated with them direct the unitive drive, which can by nature be fulfilled only by a human being of the opposite sex toward an improper object. And masturbation and pornography are also contrary to this inherently other-directed unitive drive insofar as they turn it inward toward a fantasy world rather than outward toward another human being, like an arrow pointed back at the archer. Now, even someone willing to accept the argument so far might judge that what it supports is at most a general presumption against contraception, masturbation, homosexual acts, and the like, but a presumption which might, under certain circumstances, be overridden. For example, he might concede that natural law theory shows that a general policy of using contraception or indulging in masturbation would frustrate the procreative and unitive ends of sex, respectively. But he might still maintain that if a couple has or intends to have a large family, then the occasional resort to contraception would be justifiable. Or is that as long as, in general, a person is finding sexual gratification in the arms of another person, the occasional resort to masturbation would be justifiable. Similarly, it might be thought that while the procreative and uh, end of sex would be frustrated if people in general limited themselves to homosexual sexual activity, there would still be no problem if only a relatively small number of people did so. But as is well known, natural law theory maintains that the acts in question are bad for us, not merely for the most part, but always and intrinsically bad for us. To understand why, we need to turn now to a famous, and as I noted before, some would say infamous, but widely misunderstood line of reasoning known as the perverted fact of the argument. Okay, so that brings us to stage two of the paper on the other side of the handout. When defending the perverted fact of the argument, you have to fortify yourself with Jean. Thanks, Christian. All right. So the basic idea of the perverted faculty argument is fairly simple, though a precise formulation of its key premise requires the kind of semi-formal style beloved of analytic philosophers. I would state it as follows, and, and this is um, the first premise of the argument you see reconstructed on the other side of the page there. So the principle is, quote, where some faculty F is natural to a rational agent A and by nature exists for the sake of some end E, 
and exists in A precisely so that A might pursue that end E, then it is metaphysically impossible for it to be good for A to use F in a manner contrary to E. Now, this thesis, I maintain, follows from the general Aristotelian metaphysics of the good uh, that I've defended uh, elsewhere and that I have described briefly earlier. The good for a thing is determined by the end which it has by nature. The faculty uh, F, whatever that faculty is, exists for the sake of that end E, and agents like A naturally possess F precisely so that they might pursue the end. Hence, given the underlying metaphysics, it cannot possibly be good for A to use his faculty F for the sake of preventing the realization of the end, or for the sake of an end which has an inherent tendency to frustrate the realization of E. Now, to avoid common misconceptions, it's important to be clear about exactly what this premise says and what it does not say. Note, first of all, that it is, that it is describing what is good for a rational agent. For morality is essentially about what is good for rational agents, given their nature, and not what is good for plants, animals, or inanimate objects. That is not to say that morality does not have implications for the latter, but they are derivative from morality's implications for the good for rational agents. Hence, there is nothing in the premise that implies that it is wrong for a rational agent to use a plant or an animal in a way that is contrary to what is good for it by nature, or to use an artifact in a way that is contrary to its function. Note, secondly, that the premise does not entail that a faculty cannot have more than one natural end, and neither does it entail that it cannot be good for an agent to use a faculty for an end that is other than its natural end, E. For using, uh, using it for an end different from E, or for an end that is other than E, does not entail using it contrary to E. And that's all that the principle rules out, what's contrary to the end E. Nor does the thesis entail that we have to use a faculty at all. Indeed, since the faculty, which is part of an agent, exists for the sake of the agent as a whole, it is even perfectly consistent with the premise to destroy the faculty if doing so is the only way to preserve the agent, as when one has cancerous organs surgically removed. This is known as the principle of totality, which is justified on precisely the same teleological grounds that underlie the perverted faculty argument. The premise in question says only that if an agent is actually going to use some faculty, if, then even if he uses it for some reason other than its natural entity, it cannot be good for him to use it for the sake of actively frustrating the realization of E or in a manner which of its nature tends actively to frustrate the realization of E. That's specifically what's ruled out by the principle. Nor does the thesis entail that an agent must consciously intend to try to realize the natural end, even as part of his aim whenever he uses some faculty. It entails only that whether or not he intends when using the faculty to try to realize its natural end, he cannot intend actively to frustrate the realization of that end. Nor does the premise entail that he cannot use the faculty when he knows that its end won't in fact be achieved. For in that case, he is not using the faculty for the sake of frustrating the realization of its end. And he is not himself attempting to frustrate the realization of the end in the course of using the faculty. To foresee that some faculty's end won't in fact be realized is not the same thing as using it in a way that will prevent the end from being realized. Any more than foreseeing that something will happen is the same as causing it to happen. Nor does the premise entail that to use man-made devices is per se to frustrate the natural end of some faculty. On the contrary, man-made devices can sometimes restore natural function, as with eyeglasses, or they can enhance it, as with binoculars. And one could frustrate the end of a faculty without using man-made devices. For example, if one gouged out one's own eyes using only one's bare hands. Being contrary to nature, here and in traditional natural law theory more generally, has nothing to do with whether a thing is artificial in the sense of man-made but rather with whether it actively frustrates the end toward which a faculty is naturally directed as its final cause. <clears throat> Nor, it's, wor is it, uh, it's worth emphasizing again, is the premise in any way undermined by the possibility that someone might have a deep-seated and perhaps even genetically based desire to use a faculty in a way that is contrary to its natural end. That someone is born with a club foot doesn't mean that his feet have a different natural end than those of people with normal feet. It means that while his feet have the same natural end, those feet are defective in a way that makes them less capable of realizing that natural end. That someone is born with a predilection toward alcoholism does not mean the realization of his natural ends, unlike those of other human beings, requires drinking to excess. It means instead that while he has the same natural ends as other human beings, the realization of which requires avoiding drinking to excess, he has a psychological defect that makes it harder for him to realize those ends than other people. Nor is there anything in the premise 
that entails a physicalistic emphasis on brute physiology alone. For there are psychological faculties as well as physiological faculties. And the former have ends for which they exist by nature just as much as the latter do. At the same time, the premise does not reduce morality to the question of whether one misuses a certain faculty, whether physiological or psychological. It tells us only that certain actions are inherently contrary to the good, and thus, as the argument as a whole will go on to show, for that reason ruled out. But that is not to deny that there are many other considerations to be brought to bear when developing a systematic account of morality, sexual morality or otherwise. Now, when applied to sexual morality, there is a wide range of actions which this key premise of the perverted faculty argument leaves open. For example, it is perfectly consistent with the premise for someone to refrain from sex for the sake of the priesthood or the religious life, or even just to avoid pregnancy. For the premise does not say that there is anything necessarily contrary to nature in not using a faculty, only that there is something contrary to nature in using it in a way that actually frustrates the end of the faculty. Of course, there may be other moral reasons why it would be wrong to seek to avoid pregnancy or in some other way to avoid using a faculty, but that is another question. The point is just that refraining from using a faculty, whatever the reason one refrains from using it, is not the same as perverting the faculty. Those are different concepts. Nor does the premise uh, in question imply that there is anything inherently wrong with having sex during pregnancy, or during infertile periods, or with a sterile spouse, or after menopause, or in general under circumstances in which it, would have, it is foreseen that conception will not result. For none of this involves using one's sexual faculties in a way that actively frustrates their natural ends. For seeing that a certain sexual act will in fact not result in conception is not the same thing as actively altering the relevant organ uh, or the nature of the act in a way that would make it impossible for them to lead to conception even if they were in good working order. To use organs that happen to be damaged, worn out, or otherwise non-functional to the extent that they will not realize their end is not to pervert them. Actively to try to damage them or to prevent them from functioning for the sake of making sure that their use will not result in the realization of their end is to pervert them. Nor does this key premise imply that a couple has to intend or even want to conceive when engaging in intercourse, but only that they cannot actively uh, intend to alter the nature of the act or the relevant organs in a way that would make them incapable of realizing conception, even if they were in good working order. Nor does the premise imply that a couple cannot stimulate each other's sexual organs in various ways, including manually and orally, within the overall context of an act of sexual intercourse that climaxes with a husband's ejaculating within his wife's vagina. Now, it is worth pausing over this point briefly so as to forestall simplistic interpretations of what it is to pervert faculty. Part of the reason stimulation of a certain question is not ruled out by the premise is that as long as it does not result in premature ejaculation, manual and oral stimulation of the genitals does not involve using them in a way that is contrary to their natural function, but at most for something that is only other than their natural function. But even saying that such use is for something other than their natural function is not quite right and presupposes too crude an understanding of natural function. There is nothing in the natural end of the sexual act that requires a business-like immediate penetration and swift climax any more than there is anything in the natural end of eating that requires ingesting a bland meal as quickly as, poss as, as possible. Just as enhancing the gustatory and aesthetic pleasures of, of food is not only consistent with, but can facilitate the realization of the natural end of eating, so too is enhancing the pleasures of lovemaking not only consistent with, but can facilitate the realization of the natural end of sex. Physiologically speaking, manual or oral, oral stimulation can obviously prepare the organs for intercourse, and for many women is the only way they can achieve orgasm. While psychologically speaking, such stimulation can enhance a couple's delight in one another and in their sexual relation. In that sense, such stimulation of the genitals is not really using the organs for something other than their natural end, but in fact can, can actively enhance the realization of the procreative and unitive ends of the sexual act. Similarly, there is nothing in the key premise of the perverted faculty argument that rules out the use of artificial means per se in the context of the sexual act. For example, it would not rule out the use of drugs to treat a man's impotence or the use of a vibrator by the couple during the context of intercourse as a means of treating a woman's difficulty in achieving orgasm. So the perverted faculty argument is not nearly as simplistic or restrictive in its implications as its critics seem to suppose. All the same, it does rule out exactly the sorts of practices it has traditionally been deployed and criticized. For example, use of the birth control pill or of condoms or of any other contraceptive devices would obviously involve using the sexual faculties while actively frustrating the realization of their procreative end. And it is this active frustration, rather than the artificiality of the means, that makes them in the relevant sense contrary to nature. 
That is why the withdrawal method or manual or oral stimulation of a man's genitals taken to the point of orgasm are also contrary to nature in the relevant sense, even though no artificial means are employed. For these acts, too, involve using the sexual faculties in a way that actively frustrates their natural procreative end. Masturbation involves a twofold frustration of the natural end of sex. For one thing, it frustrates the procreative end insofar as the natural end of the physiological process in the male, leading from arousal to ejaculation, is not only to get semen out of the male, but into the woman, while the natural end of the physiological process of arousal in the female is to prepare the vagina for reception of semen. But it also frustrates the unit of end, masturbation does, insofar as arousal is other-directed in a psychological sense, no less than a physiological sense. Male sexual arousal is of its nature woman-oriented, and female sexual arousal is of its nature man-oriented. In each case, the realization of the natural end requires connecting emotionally as well as physically with another person. Masturbation involves actively taking the process of arousal to a climax that does not involve another person, and thus turns it against its natural end. Similarly, homosexual acts and bestiality are also, uh, in this case, they're twofold in their frustration of the natural end of sex. They both frustrate the procreative end insofar as they involve the act of taking of the physiological processes associated with sexual arousal toward a climax in which conception would be impossible even in principle, even when all of the faculties of the parties involved are in good working order. They also frustrate the unitive end insofar as they involve actively taking the psychological process of arousal through to an emotional climax that involves an object other than the one toward which nature has directed it. In the one case toward a person of the wrong sex, in the other case toward an object that isn't even a person, in the case of bestiality. When we add to these considerations the further natural law thesis that practical reason has its own natural end, namely the pursuit of what is good and the avoidance of what frustrates the realization of the good, this is Aquinas' famous first principle of natural law, then we have the ingredients for a, for, for a formal presentation of the perverted faculty argument as applied to the use of our sexual faculty. It can be stated as follows. And here I turn to the um, seven-step statement of the argument there on the back side of the handout. Step one, where some faculty F is natural to a rational agent A and by nature exists for the sake of some end E and exists in A precisely so that A might pursue E, then it is metaphysically impossible for it to be good for A to use F in a manner that is contrary to E. That's the uh, basic premise that we uh, spelled out earlier. Step two, but our sexual faculties exist by nature for the sake of procreative and unitive end, and exist in us precisely so that we might pursue those ends. And so step three, it is metaphysically impossible for it to be good for us to use those faculties in a manner that is contrary to their procreative and unitive end. Step four, but procreative, but contraceptive acts, masturbation, homosexual acts, etc., involve the use of our sexual faculties in a manner that is contrary to their procreative and or unit of end. And so step five, it is metaphysically impossible for it to be good for us to engage in contraceptive acts, masturbatory acts, homosexual acts, etc. Step six, but it can, be it can be rational to engage in an act only if it is in some way good for us and never when it frustrates the realization of the good. And so overall conclusion step seven, it cannot be rational to engage in contraceptive acts, masturbatory acts, homosexual acts, etc. Now, the answers to the standard objections to this argument might be obvious from what I've said already, but it's worthwhile addressing them explicitly. Uh, Paul Weithman, a critic of the perverted faculty argument, summarizes several of them in an essay he contributed to the anthology uh, Sex, Preference, and Family, edited by David Eslin and Martha Nussbaum a few years ago. Weithman claims first that the argument depends on what he calls, quote, a principle forbidding interference with the reproductive organs' performance of their natural functions, unquote, which he says is, obvious, is, is open to obvious counterexamples insofar as even natural law theorists allow that a diseased uterus and ovaries might legitimately be removed even though this Im, uh, impedes their function. But the problems with this objection are, first, that it rests on an imprecise formulation of the perverted faculty argument's key premise, that first premise. And second, that it ignores the role that the principle of totality plays in justifying the alleged counterexample. For one thing, the perverted faculty argument does not object to, object to interference with a natural faculty. That's not, the, that's not the concept that's relevant here. Again, enhancement of a natural faculty, such as the use of eyeglasses or binoculars, is perfectly consistent with the argument, even though it involves a kind of interference. So too is the removal, 
removal of a diseased organ on the grounds that the organ exists precisely for the sake of the human being as a whole, and therefore can be removed if this is necessary to save the human being as a whole. In both of these cases, it is precisely the realization of the natural end, inherent in human nature, that is being furthered, in the one case by enhancing the natural faculties, and in the other by preserving the life of the whole person, so that at least some of his natural ends might still be realized, even if others no longer can be. Removal of a healthy organ, by contrast, could not be given such a teleological justification. <clears throat> in the latter case, uh, precisely because the diseased faculty is being removed, it is not being used at all. By contrast, contraception, homosexual acts, and the like do involve the use of a faculty, but precisely in a way that actively frustrates the natural ends of such use rather than facilitating the realization of those ends. That is what makes such acts perverse in a way that the enhancement of healthy organs or the removal of diseased organs is not. And it is this perverse sort of use, that is to say, actively frustrating a faculty to an end positively contrary to its natural one, rather than interference as such that the argument rules out. Weithman also claims that the perverted faculty argument, quote, see, seems suspiciously ad hoc, unquote, and fails to, uh, to draw what Weithman calls a, quote, a principal distinction between the reproductive organs whose frustration the principle forbids and other organs whose operation it is permissible to, Im uh, to impede, unquote. But what is truly suspicious is how consistently imprecise, prone to caricature, and incapable of giving a charitable reading, critics of the perverted faculty argument seem to be. Weifman offers no examples of ad hoc allowances for, quote, organs whose operation it is permissible to impede, but it is easy enough to find alleged examples in literature. Uh, for example, Germaine Grise, with apologies to Professor George, uh, cite uh, new natural law theorist Germaine Grise. Grise cites the use of earplugs, uh, quote, of walking on one's hands, which interferes at least temporarily with their proper function, smoking in which we use the respiratory system in, uh, in a way which does frustrate its proper function to a considerable extent, hanging rings in one's ears or nose, which by stretching them out of shape may lessen their effectiveness, ingesting some food and drink by mouth for satisfaction, although for medical reasons, the stomach constantly is pumped so that nothing is digested, and lactation in which there is excess milk and it is pumped out of the breast and thrown away even when the infant is fed artificially during such time. Okay, these are all uh, quotes from uh, Grise, of, of examples that he takes to be ad hoc exceptions to the general, um, uh, general principle of perverted faculty argument. Other alleged examples given by some other critics uh, involve, would, would include shaving, chewing gum, using antiperspirant, and one writer even, even gives damming rivers, building dams, as something that a consistent natural law theorist could say is contrary to nature. Okay. Um, now, such examples are often presented as obviously devastating when, in fact, they have no force whatsoever against the argument when it is properly understood. Here it is important to keep four points in mind. First, it cannot be repeated too often that the perverted faculty argument does not entail there is anything wrong with the use of man-made devices or the use of a faculty for something merely, that is merely other than its natural function or the interference with natural processes where plants, non-human animals, or inanimate objects and processes are concerned. That's just a straw man. Nor is there anything ad hoc about this, for the whole point of the argument is simply to draw out the implications of the Aristotelian position that, it, that what is good for us can, in principle, only be what is consistent with the realization of our natural ends. And neither artificial devices, nor the pursuit of ends other than our natural end, nor interference with non-human natural processes are inherently contrary to the realization of our natural end. Hence, examples like chewing gum, which is merely other than, rather than contrary to, the natural end of our digestive faculties, or the use of earplugs, which, though artificial, facilitate the realization of our natural ends, insofar as they protect the ears from excessive noise, facilitate sleep, etc., and the damming of rivers, which doesn't even concern human faculties in the first place, all of these examples simply miss the point of the argument. Second, for any of these examples to be true counterexamples, they have to be cases that really do involve the frustration of a natural end. And with at least some of them, that is simply not even prima facie plausible. For example, Grise never explains exactly how earrings or nose piercings might, quote, lessen the effectiveness of the ears or nose. And of course, those who do sport these decorations rarely complain of any resulting difficulty in hearing or smelling. And if someone did so mutilate the ears or nose that their function was impaired, this would not be a counterexample to the perverted faculty argument, but rather exactly the sort of thing that the traditional natural law theory would condemn. 
they really did uh, interfere with these natural functions. Nor is it clear how walking on one's hands frustrates their natural end even temporarily. A hand is evidently a general purpose organ without the sort of specificity of function that eyes, ears, and genitals have. Even if it is insisted that they are for grasping things specifically, there is no specific sort of thing that they're made to grasp and no specific sort of occasion or length of time that they are intended by nature to be grasping things. Walking on them no more frustrates their natural end than leaving them hanging by one side does. It is clearly at worst in the, quote, other than, rather than the contrary to category. Eating food that one will, for medical reasons, uh, out of one's control, not be able safely to keep down is also not a plausible candidate for something that is contrary to the natural end of eating any more than removing a diseased organ. A third point to keep in mind is that there are crucial differences between, on the one hand, an individual deliberate act of using a bodily faculty, and on the other hand, an ongoing and involuntary physiological process. Use of the sexual organs is an example of the former, whereas hair growth, breathing, perspiring, and lactating are examples of the latter. Now, the former has a specific end state or climax, the former sort of act, a specific end state or climax, while the latter sort of biological functions do not. In particular, the former has as its physiological end a specific emission or reception of semen, while the latter have as their ends the continual generation of hair, sweat, and milk, and the continual oxidation of the blood. There is no specific individual event that, indi that initiates the latter sort of process, and there is no specific individual event that culminates any of these processes either. It is oxidation in general, hair production in general, sweat production in general, and milk production in general that is their natural end. And those general outcomes are not frustrated by any individual act of smoking, shaving, breast pumping, or putting on antiperspirant. By contrast, the, pro the process that begins with arousal and ends with ejaculation within the vagina is episodic rather than ongoing. And its outcome, which is a specific event, is frustrated by contraception, masturbation, and the like. A fourth point uh, to keep in mind is that it's crucial to understand that traditional natural law theory, given its Aristotelian foundations, does not draw the sort of rigid distinction between matters of ethics and matters of practicality, good mental and physical health, etc., that modern moral theorists tend to draw. Ethics for Aristotelians is a matter of how to live well in all aspects of life. Anything that enters into living well, from avoiding stress to avoiding disease to avoiding murder and adultery, is part of the moral life, broadly construed. At the same time, by no means is every failure to live well a grave error or mortal sin. Many such failures, including some failures to respect the natural ends of our faculties, are merely minor lapses. There is, accordingly, a bit of question-begging sleight of hand in objections to the perverted faculty argument that pretend that it would be an embarrassment to the theory if it turned out that the argument entailed that failure to breastfeed one's infants, say, uh, or cleaning too much of the wax out of one's ears were contrary to what is good for us. The traditional natural law theorist would say in response to this, quote, yes, of course such things might be contrary to what is good for us, as even your doctor will tell you. And that is all that the perverted faculty argument by itself is claiming. It does not follow that every frustration of a natural end is a grave sin. That depends on how crucial to the good for us as rational animals the faculty in question is. And that is determined by such considerations as how fully it participates in our distinctively rational faculties, how significant it is to our nature as social animals, and so forth, unquote. Hence, masturbation and pornography, which turn sexual pleasure away from its natural end, of leading a person intensely to delight in it and thereby bond emotionally with another individual human being and reduces it to a kind of recreational virtual reality are bound to be far more seriously damaging to realizing the good for us as rational social animals than is, say, overuse of cotton swabs to clean one's ears. The former can seriously distort one's ability to find sexual fulfillment in a spouse. The latter can cause a mere ear infection. It would be silly to pretend that the latter is a grave moral fault, but it would be equally silly to deny that it is at least a mild lapse in a virtue like prudence. A genuine counterexample to the perverted faculty argument's key premise would have to involve an action that both involved the active frustration of the natural end of a faculty, and yet, which was at the same time in no way contrary to what is good for us, not even in a minor respect. I submit that there are no such counterexamples, and that there could not be, at least given an Aristotelian metaphysics of it. And I will end uh, with that. That's the natural end of my talk, so I will end. Thank you, Professor Fieser. I think that's up too loud. Can that be turned down a little?
Do you want to? I'm sorry? Oh, okay, so let me just. That might be the light. That's from the light. The volume switch. Do you know where the volume switch is? So maybe just move down. Okay. Good. How's that? Can you still hear me? Good. Well, uh, Professor Fieser, thanks for that uh, marvelously sophisticated defense of the much maligned, including by me, uh, <laughs> perverted faculty argument. Uh, we have uh, a good solid half hour uh, for Q&A, and I don't want to uh, monopolize it, but I wonder if I could just throw out uh, a few items, um, and ma maybe you could, um, you could note them down rather than my stating them and then you responding. And, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just hold you for five minutes on these, and then we'll open it uh, for, the, for the audience uh, as a whole. And these are mainly um, for clarification, because it was densely packed. The argument was densely packed, and Professor uh, Fieser was moving quickly, necessarily moving quickly. So I want to get a few things uh, out there so that we can focus on them and maybe just get another word or two by way of explanation and defense. Uh, uh, first, I note that very central to Professor Fieser's efforts to uh, rectify many misunderstandings of the, of the uh, perverted faculty argument is this. He wants to make sure that we don't think, as so many critics of the argument have thought, that the argument is about not frustrating natural functions. That's not his argument. His argument is that there's something wrong with using a faculty, not a function, with using a faculty in a way contrary to the end for the sake of which, by nature, the faculty exists. Now, it's that I think we've got to explore. So I just uh, like another uh, word or two from Professor Fieser on the following points. Uh, how do we understand a faculty and distinguish it from a function? Second. How are to we, yeah, and this, this second one, you've, you've, if you want to just rest on what you've already said, that's, that's fine because you know, we don't have time to do everything, and you have said a word about it. I'd personally like to hear more about what con uh, contrast, uh, uh, constitutes activity contrary to. Could you explicate a little bit the idea of contrary to? One on which I myself rely in my own uh, philosophical uh, uh, account of um, normative ethical judgments then for the sake of which, okay, a faculty that, a, a, um, a, um, a faculty that exists for the sake of a certain end. What does it mean for a faculty to exist for the sake of a certain end? And then finally, what does it mean for a, fac for a faculty to exist for the sake of a certain end which by nature it exists to serve? The concept of by nature as opposed to possibly something else. But what does by nature here uh, mean? Okay, so that's uh, number one. Uh, secondly, uh, are you invested at all, or would you yield a little bit, uh, on the, um, the line that you had early in the talk that said that, uh, of course, uh, people are generally drawn to sex because of pleasure. Uh, say a couple of things about that, and the reason I, I would like you to back away from that a little bit. One, uh, pleasure is a highly problematical concept. Uh, if you look at uh, Roger Scruton's treatment in his book, Sexual Desire, you see just how complicated it is uh, in the domain of sex, but not just in the uh, domain of sex. Uh, and one of the... Um, one of the things that I took away from Scruton, I became convinced of reading Scruton, and then just by talking with people and observing human beings, is that actually, although it's true that sometimes people do want sex just for pleasure, that's actually quite rare. That uh, pe and people say that, and, and, and that, I mean, that's commonly believed. I mean, just our net, you know, we, we say that kind of thing all the time. But I think that if you, if you look at the thing phenomenologically, you do the kind of analysis Scruton does, which I think is spot on, you see that people are really after a kind of unity. 
a kind of unity with the other that is not really reducible to pleasure unless you soup up the concept of pleasure That's to make it... To, oh, yeah, okay, all right. Um, I have so many other things, but I'll just do, give, you, give you one more. Um, are you invested at all in the idea that contraception is a sexual act? Because it seems to me that while contraception is chosen to facilitate sexual acts, or for some, sometimes for some other reasons, um, uh, it's actually not a sexual act. So it, it's not uh, just another uh, species of the genus that includes uh, uh, fornication, adultery, uh, uh, sodomy, uh, bestiality, and and so forth. It's in a different category. Now, that, that's not to suggest that it's not subject to moral evaluation or even that it's morally permissible. I actually don't think it is. But I, I just don't think it's a sexual act just as such. So let me toss those three out. We, when we have a chance privately at some point, we'll talk about some of the other questions I have in mind. But what about those three, the first being rather complex, I know. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll, because it's more complex, I'll answer them in reverse order. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't say contraception per se is a sexual act, and I, I don't. I, I may have formulated something uh, in an imprecise way in the course of the paper, which led you to ask that. So I would I would qualify it, but I um, I may have made reference to contraceptive sexual acts or contraceptive acts, but the sexual component wouldn't be in the contraception, but in the the rest of the act, and the contraception is a is an, an impeding of of that. Uh, of the sexual act. Yeah, so. I, I think that's right. And I think it can be shown with an example, actually, from Grise, which is that what if a tyrant puts contraceptive uh, uh, substances in the water supply in order to, to reduce the population? I mean, he's, he's, what he's doing is contraception, but it's actually not a sexual act at all, obviously. And it's not even somebody choosing it to facilitate a sexual act. Yeah, it's, I mean, it certainly wouldn't be a sexual act. Though I don't know that I... I mean, it would be an act that would have contraceptive uh, consequences, though I don't know if it would be a contraceptive act in, in quite the same way that the couple who uses a contraceptive device or a woman who takes the pill would be engaging, indulging, engaging. Well, the in difference is they're act. trying to facilitate uh, a, a sexual act by yeah. rendering render it. The common thing is that they're, they're, what, what both actors have in mind is turning sexual acts that would otherwise be fertile into infertile acts. They're start trying to sterilize right. sexual acts. Right, right. Though in one case, their own, and in the other case, those that, other That's people. exactly right. But yeah, in either case, I would, I would not, I would agree that the, the act of contraception is not itself a kind of that's sexual right. act. Yeah. Um, pleasure? On, so on pleasure, I would, I would beef up or soup up the concept of pleasure. And I, I totally agree with you that um, what most people are seeking is not pleasure in some sort of crude, dumbed-down Jeremy Bentham. Yeah, sense, okay, you know. right. Um, it's a much richer notion of pleasure. I think even the most, you know, even the most, um, I don't want to say every one of them, but, but even the most uh, immoral sexual encounters, the most impersonal ones, typically are after far more than just some, you know, pleasant physiological sensation. It goes well beyond that. It always involves, for example, someone's perception of the intentions and desires and thought processes going on in the, in the sexual partner which already makes the pleasure involved far more than merely some brute physiological sensation involved a, a fairly sophisticated uh, psychological element. Given the connotations of pleasure in our ordinary discourse, which you and I, neither you nor I nor, nor us together can, uh, are, are going to budge, do you think in our own analysis we should lay off the concept, except where we mean what people mean by pleasure, in those cases where people are just after pleasure, but it seems to me we're impeded in getting through to the audiences we want to reach in part because when we say pleasure, meaning the souped up thing that includes the desire for a kind of interpersonal unity, a particular kind of interpersonal unity, they're missing that because they think it's, we're talking about tingles and chills, Benthamism. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I think that instead of uh, avoiding the concept, we should insist on a more sophisticated understanding of the concept. We should point out that their, their own concept of pleasure is deficient. And it's, it doesn't correspond to what most human beings actually mean when, they're, when they... So they talk about seeking pleasure in the sexual act. And the reason I brought it up in the paper is just that it's sometimes claimed that, well, pleasure is also an end of the sexual act alongside these other ones. So I wanted to clarify what, from a traditional natural law point of view, uh, the role pleasure plays in it. it to, to say that, there is, that pleasure is part of the natural order of sex, 
is true, but that doesn't mean it's an end of sex yeah. in the way that procreationary or, or the unit of end of sex is. Yeah, but I, uh, I agree with that. But I, I think that the intelligible good that we're actually after in um, marital communion is one plus union. It's that union. Uh, so if, if that union is itself to be accounted in terms, accounted for in terms of pleasure, then what we're saying is pleasure is an yep. intelligible good and it is a reason. And that just is going to mislead, I think, if we say that. That's my worry. It might, but I think that just means that we need to be careful about what we mean by, by the term. And the pleasure isn't merely physiological. It involves, say, a, a, you know, it might involve a sense of completion uh, that another human being provides, say. That's a kind of pleasure. I mean, people take pleasure in the fact that they've got a good marriage, where what they mean by that is not merely that they've got pleasant bodily sensation. Mm -hmm. um, they mean something much richer than that. But, they, but there is a, a clear sense in which it involves a kind of pleasure. It's pleasing to be with a spouse with whom you know, one feels especially close and so forth, even if it's not a, a, a crude kind of merely animal pleasure. But, but the, the pleasing there is a fragment of the larger good. Yes, it's a, you know, right. And, and then on the, uh, the faculty uh, versus function distinction, I, 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 I use the word faculty rather than function in part just because it's the traditional term, you know, when we talk about the perverted faculty argument. Uh, also because, uh, of course, it, you know, just as in Aristotelian philosophy, substances are prior to their operation, substances are prior to events into which the substances might enter and so forth. In the same way, a faculty is prior to the function that the faculty serves. But I would not want to say that my argument concerns only faculties and not functions. Oh, really? Oh, There's okay. a relationship between them. It, 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 one relationship being that how we characterize a, a faculty is in part determined by what we know about its function. You know, so when we talk about eyeballs and their function of seeing and so forth, and we see how they actually operate and how they enter into the life of an overall organism, how they function, in other words, that is part of what tells us what they are. So in, in, the, in the metaphysical order, in the ontological order, eyes are, primary, are prior to, say, their, their function of seeing. But in the epistemological order, it's we often know functions first, yeah. and then we infer the nature of the thing which performs the function. But, but there'd be no problem with, for example, interfering with the function of digestion, with digestion as a function, right? So, so stopping digestion, because you had some reason to stop digestion. Uh, right, I would, I would, yeah, I would say that. Because that's and, not and a I, faculty, right? Digestion's not. Digestion's a not a faculty. It's a function. Correct, correct. Stomach and the other organs involved would be would be the faculties, or mm -hmm. but um, or the the whole system, well, say, would be the would would. would that be doesn't the sound right to me. Well, yeah, I mean, as I'm the saying, I can't be the faculty. The, the, what's that? Uh, the organs can't be the faculty. The organs aren't the faculty, but you might say the let's say the organs are the seat of the faculty, by which they perform a certain function. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, so you know how we how we determine whether a certain function might be impeded under what circumstances. I think we there we have to go on a case by case basis. But I wouldn't just say, well, what I have to say has nothing to do with functions, only with faculties. I, I would I would hesitate to say that. Okay. Because there is this connection between them. Can, can I then uh, kind of sharpen the the essence of those uh, questions I had in the first one mm -hmm. by asking uh, what what What's the reason not to regard sexual organs in the way uh, we regard hands? Uh, to use your phrase, general purpose organs. Yeah. So what's, what's the answer to somebody who says, well, uh, a, a male sexual organ or a female sexual organ is a multiple pur purpose organ. There are lots of things you can do with it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, to some extent that's true. I mean, you urinate as well as perform the mm -hmm. sexual act. Um, but as I emphasized toward the end of the paper, there's also the consideration that we, I think we need to distinguish between um, faculties whose operation is episodic from faculties whose operation is, is uh, continuous. Uh, so for I gave breathing, for example, is something that's it's outside our control. It's a kind of uh, biological function. Uh, in, you might say it involves a kind of faculty, but it's not some kind of episodic event where we, we decide to breathe and then we breathe and then somebody might interfere with this particular episode of breathing. It's not the same kind of thing biologically as the sexual act is, say. Mm -hmm. And hands, I, I take, would be yet another sort of example, where they're not, I mean, there are episodes of using a hand, but unlike uh, sexual arousal through to climax, which is, a, uh, an, which is an episodic uh, occurrence, it's not continuous, um, but it involves a kind of, you know, initiation, uh, development, and then climax 
the hand isn't quite like that either. It's something we're always, you know, to some extent using, either by, by gesturing or by grabbing something uh, or by lying back and holding our head to no, And why, why should it there's morally no matter? There's no, speci there's no specific sort of episode that, or a specific sort of end that the hand is for in the way that uh, the sexual organs have a specific episode. Now, there's more, again, it is, there's more than one because uh, the sexual organs, in the case of the males, they are for urinating as well as for, uh, for having sexual relations. But it doesn't have the kind of um, general purpose function that hands have. Why would that matter more from a moral point of view? Well, the reason it would matter from a moral point of view is that what it would involve to frustrate the end of the hand is simply not as clear-cut a thing as it is in the case of the sexual organ, or as it is in the case of the eyes, say. Eyes pretty much are for seeing, and that's about it. Maybe either we could identify some other function they perform, but it's pretty much confined to seeing. So <clears throat> when we want to determine what it is that would involve the frustration of the faculty of seeing, or the frustration of using our eyes, say, it's, it's not a terribly complicated thing, whereas in the case of hands, they're so general purpose that what might count as frustrating them is not as clear-cut as in the case of the eye. And so what I'm suggesting is that the sexual organs are more like the eye than they are like the hand. I, I see the, the, the difference in the description. I still don't see the moral significance. It, it, and it looks to me like somewhere embedded in there has got to be the idea that there's some good that is harm in the case of using the sexual organ in a way that yeah. we judge to be. So, so, so. Well, there is a good involved, but there's a good involved in both. I mean, in the case of the hands, no less than the case of the sexual organs, nature gives us hands for a reason, right? So, I mean, a, an obvious case, I guess, where you'd frustrate the natural ends of the hands is if you, I don't know, you had, let's say, your arms tied around, you know, tied to the back of your body for six months long or some, yeah. some crazy mm -hmm. thing, you know, uh, so that you're always stumbling into things, you're not, you fall down, your, your face hits the ground directly, you're not able to, uh, to, um, uh, to block the damage to your face, you're not able to feed yourself, and so on and so forth. Now, whether that would involve any sort of um, major moral lapse or a moral lapse at all would uh, take analysis. But the point is that we can make sense of what it would be to frustrate the ends of the hands, but it would have to be something pretty dramatic like that. Because hands are so general purpose, we'd have to describe a scenario where you're not able to grab things, you're not able to, to, to block your face from being damaged when you fall down, uh, and you're not able to climb up hills and so on and uh -huh. so forth. But it, and, and that would be bad for us given the kind of creatures that we are. That's, that's the point. That, that would involve the frustration of a good for us. I mean, it's good but, but for us the, to use our hands, it's good for us to use our other organs just as it is to use our... So at the end of the day, it's going to be the, the, the trouble with acting contrary to the end, using the faculty contrary to the end, has got to be that there's some intelligible good that yeah. is thereby harmed. Yes. And, 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 and just the frustration of the faculty in itself would be an insufficient description of the wrong. You need, you're, you're, you're well, worried the, about the, the contrary for a reason, the reason being the intelligible good, which has got to be identified apart from the yeah. contrary to bit. Right. So, right. and then the question is, right. how do you identify it? And then we're right. back to the, you know, the debate between our two. So, well, the notion of frustration then, it, you know, the, the notion that there's a good built, built into the faculty, which you are preventing, is part of what means, what, what is meant by frustration in the analysis. The notion of good is yeah, built in. I think that's what's got to be, that would be the next step, I think, in, in your argument, to spell that out. That would be good to hear. Okay. Good. Well, OK, I've, I said I wasn't monopolized it, and I have. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me open the floor for, for questions. Yeah, Brian, uh, Zach, talk to Zach. 
but you're not saying what's natural is good, right? No. That, that's, that's too vague. Yeah. Well, um, oh, uh, did people have trouble hearing the question? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, it was a kind of a well, rich I can, question. I can, I can try yeah, to summarize each question, then if, yeah. I, if I mischaracterize it, you know, just let me know. But, um, so the first question was about why you're asking about um, why I take nature to be good or nature to determine what's good for us. And as you, as you said, um, I'm presupposing a general Aristotelian metaphysics of the good here, which it's true I do not de develop and defend just because of the limits of the, the paper and so forth. And I've said a lot about that elsewhere. But, um, but definitely I'm committed to that particular metaphysics. And it's a metaphysics that I, I would say is not only defensible, but I think it's, I think it's correct. I, and I think that the, the two key elements of the metaphysics are, first of all, essentialism, and secondly, teleology, which I just alluded to along the course of the, of the talk. But um, as, as I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, you can think on analogy with biological examples, like uh, the way a tree uh, sinks roots, and it does so for the sake of growing in water and nutrients, or the way a squirrel hoards food for the winter, say, uh, to use that stock example. Now, uh, naturally, from a naturalistic point of view, the teleology we attribute to those processes is merely a kind of a useful fiction, which you could cash out in uh, Darwinian terms, which would make reference only to, say, what Aristotelians would call efficient material causes and make no reference to formal final causes. Now, I don't think that's correct. I think that um, in our analysis of any natural system, uh, we're never going to eliminate entirely any reference to formal and final causes. We're only going to relocate it. We're going to kick it down to some lower level, or we're going to kick it up to the level of uh, human thought. We're going to say it's merely a projection of the mind, but the, ac the act of projecting is itself teleological. Itself has a kind of intentionality or directedness, which is a species of final causality or teleology. Now, this is a big argument. I mean, I would say that, in fact, all the areas in which common sense and traditional Aristotelian philosophy say there is irreducible teleology, at the biological realm, in the case of human beings, at, at a lower realm in the case of non-human animals, at a yet lower realm at the, at the vegetative level, at the inorganic level in various respects. I, I would, I'm a realist about all those kinds of intentionality, all, all those kinds of teleology, rather. And I'm a realist about essences at, at every one of those levels. But obviously, I can't defend every one of those le levels in a, in a talk or in a, in a Q&A. But um, I'm biting a big metaphysical bullet there, and I'm quite happy to do so. Uh, and I've defended it at length elsewhere. But, but once that's in place, I would say the, the whole metaphysics of the good that Aristotelianism bu traditionally builds on that is also in place. And that is a presupposition of what I have to say here, where, where I'm just applying that general analysis to sector morality in, in particular. So if the objection is that, well, you're assuming a lot metaphysically, my answer is guilty. I am assuming a lot metaphysically. But I'm not assuming it full stop. I'm assuming it for the sake of the current discussion, but I defend it at length elsewhere. In, in, books and articles. I think it's really important to understand uh, the sense of the term natural that's being used here, uh, because the, the term is used in so many different ways. When the, when the Pope said, remember Pope Francis said, uh, after the Charlie Hebdo uh, shooting, he said, well, you know, if, uh, if someone insults your mother, and you naturally get angry, and you bop them in the nose. Uh, well, it is true. There's a sense of natural in which that's true, but uh, you know, you obviously would not want to infer from the fact that it's right. natural to get angry when someone insults your mother that it's good to be angry and to bop somebody in the nose. Exactly, yeah. right, right. Other, this is one of those many cases where you'll find in uh, Aristotelian and Thomistic and Scholastic writing more generally a number of crucial distinctions. Mm -hmm. um, and the distinctions are very important. They're the distinctions between two senses of natural. Gosh, lots of hands up. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, you brought up it. Um, Well, it, I mean, it, I guess it depends on, you know, how much walking on your hands you're doing. I mean, if, you're, if you're, you know, if you're doing it to the point where, uh, you know, you're damaging the structure of the bones of the fingers and so forth, then I would say 
uh, yeah, you, you're, you're, you're doing something that's contrary to the natural end of the, uh, of the function of the hand, and maybe you should stop it, but you don't have to be a natural law theorist to say that. You only have to be a medical doctor to want to say that. So that's not a, like I say, if, there, if there's a sense in which walking in your hands, walking on your hands can be um, contrary to the natural end of the hands, then we need to explain exactly how, and if that's the kind of scenario you have in mind, then I would say, yeah, it might follow that's contrary to the natural end, but why is that a problem? Since everybody, merely for medical reasons, would say that, yeah, you don't want to keep walking on your hands if you make it impossible now to actually use them to grasp things, or you're, you, know, you develop arthritis, or you're constantly in pain. I mean, people would say for what they take to be purely medical reasons rather than moral reasons that you shouldn't do that. But remember, from the Aristotelian point of view, ethics is about living well in the broad sense, not merely in this restricted, narrow um, sense that, that, uh, that we think of morality in terms of in, in uh, contemporary uh, ethical theory. You're, you're next. Well, it's, I mean, very, I guess... Very brief summary of the question. Yeah, the, oh, the, the question was whether or not... The, the question was um, about whether the account I gave uh, is, an in, is incomplete from the point of view of giving a, a complete system of sexual morality. Shouldn't we be focused on the whole agent, would you say? Would you say? And, and, yeah. and, and I would agree with that. I mean, I'm not pretending to give a complete sexual morality in, in, the, in the paper. And um, the reason for the focus on the minutia, say, of the sexual act is simply because this is the area in which natural law theory is so often attacked. So as a result, you've kind of got to focus on that. I mean, people, people say, oh, natural law theorists are obsessed with sex. Believe me, there are a lot of other things I'd rather be talking about. You know, I, <laughs> I can get a few cheap jokes out of it in a lecture, you know, but other than that, you know, I'd rather not be talking about it. But that's where natural law theorists are most relentlessly attacked. So naturally, We've got to defend ourselves on that. And, uh, but then when we do, we're accused of obsessing over not only sex, but over the minutia of the sexual act. But, um, but a complete account, I think, would, would do exactly what you're talking about. It would focus on the role that the sexual act, which is only a small part, relative, you know, it's certainly part of time, uh, in the overall life of a married couple, say, um, would focus on the way that is understood in that larger context. And to be a man or a woman is not merely to have certain sexual organs. It, involves a much richer psychological and personal um, uh, set of features. Uh, so a complete sexual morality would, um, would discuss all of that. And the sort of thing I'm just talking about here would just be a chapter set in a book on a subject that, that, uh, that set out a complete sexual morality. So I, I agree with you. I agree with the premise of your question. I can, I can give you a couple of antidotes if you want to get off the sex thing. <laughs> you, all all you've got to do is publish something. This is from my own experience. Publish something that's really critical of lying. <laughs> or something that's really critical of the principle of combat, uh, non-combatant immunity and war, and suddenly yeah. you're going to be accused of being obsessed with 
two other things. Okay, <laughs> that's a good idea. Well, I, you know, I, I suffered enormously for suggesting once that maybe parents shouldn't uh, tell their, their children that Santa Claus, that, that it might be a very mild lie. Tell me about you it, would, brother. Tell you'd me be amazed at how much abuse I've got I, I wouldn't be amazed. I've been there. <laughs> so I think I know my next lecture topic. Uh, I, I see only male hands. I don't like that. Uh, there must be some of our uh, women students who have questions. Okay, if you don't, you don't. Maybe you guys have all got this worked out and the guys are still working on it. Yep. <laughs> um, so, um, I want to um, uh, tell the same thing. So, first of all, um, what, do you, what do you think the fact that uh, sex lacks or socialization or not necessarily other crimes like phone books? They, they frequently use sex in order to. Um, Well, okay, so I, if, if I remember, I think, you, I think there are three issues you raised. On the first one, which was on the bonobo, bonobo example, um, well, you know, maybe in a, in a treatment of uh, bonobo sex, you know, the functions of sex might be broader than the ones identified. But I wasn't talking about bonobo sex. I was talking about human sex. So, I mean, that, that's kind of the short and glib answer. Now, um, the details, you know, the, the, the devil's in the details, so it depend on... Uh, on the general character of life among that particular kind of creature. And there's certainly nothing in natural law theory that entails that what I say about human beings or what the theory says about human beings would apply across the board to other kinds of animals. There might be all sorts of different forms of life, as Wittgenstein might put it, that you find in, in different animals that would, that would make what they do very different from human beings. Um, but that wouldn't per se be relevant to what we say about human beings. That's one point. Another point is, of course, I mean, in human beings as well, sex might perform those functions. But of, of say, you know, uh, obviously, uh, sex can cool tensions between spouses. Say, I mean, that's you know, kind of in the ballpark of sort of. It wasn't exactly what you talk, you're talking about, but it's not totally unrelated to, to it either. But it wouldn't follow that that's a function that somehow is on an, on a on a par with the other functions, or that that function could be pursued in a way that would frustrate the unitive and procreative function. So. To say that sex has unitive and procreative functions doesn't entail that there aren't other functions. Um, the natural law theorists would simply say that any other functions would, would be secondary and couldn't frustrate the realization of, of, the, of the primary function. Okay. Um, you also raised, if I, let's see if I remember, the question of oh, pain. You talked about pain, for example. Well, pain, I mean, pain certainly serves a biological function. And, those, that function is to get us away from sources of damage. I mean, it's to, to lead us to avoid things that are going to be harmful to us. The case of someone, say, who's, um, you know, suffering terminal cancer and is in enormous pain continuously, 
Um, certainly that function is being fulfilled uh, by the fact the person now knows there's something wrong and is doing something to treat it and so forth. Um, so by deadening the pain, I don't think we're frustrating any natural end of the, of, the, of the function that pain serves biologically. But there's also the fact that in the case of pain, unlike the case of, say, reproduction or the case of seeing or, or any other sort of uh, act that we might tend to do given our nature, pain involves a positive harm to the overall organism that uh, having a baby does not, per se. Doesn't, you know, somebody would say, yeah, but, but I, if I have the baby, I will not be able to go to grad school or I won't be able to take this particular job. But that would be a harm that's incidental to the having of the baby. It's not inherent in the, the simple fact of having a baby. Whereas suffering, the pain someone suffers during cancer, say, is it's in itself a harm. So it's, though there is a natural function that pain serves in the overall life of an organism, uh, we still have to make this distinction. Uh, between the function it serves and the sorts of functions other things serve. They're not, you know, to, to, to defend the perverted fact of the argument in uh, the context of sexual morality, it's important to emphasize that it's not something that in any obvious way applies to every single aspect of, uh, of every human faculty in exactly the same way. The devil's in the details, so we need to, to, to look at the, the differences as well as the similarities between the functions of things like pain and the, and the, the functions of things like the sexual organs. Um, I, I can't remember the third. Oh, a higher purpose. So, for example, using contraception <clears throat> in order to avoid the burdens of big families and therefore enable people more time and effort to other human systems. Well, I mean, I would say that. Here, I mean, one of the crucial considerations is that this, this distinction between refraining from using a faculty and, on the one hand and positively frustrating it in its, in its realization of the end on the other. I don't think there's anything per se wrong with refraining from marrying or refraining from sexual uh, relations in marriage, uh, a la you know, natural family planning for the sake of ends of that sort. No, nothing per se wrong. There might in the circumstances be, but that's another question. Um, but again, that's very different from positively frustrating the ends of a faculty. And so the, the theory, while the theory would certainly allow not using a faculty, that's different from the theory for the sake of some other good. That's different from the theory allowing the positive frustration of faculty. The claim of the perverted faculty argument is that there's certain acts, and in the case of sex, that's only one. I mean, another example, which Professor George brought up, you brought up the topic of lying, and from a traditional natural law theory point of view on it, I mean, a perverted, the perverted fact of the argument applies there as well, that lying, as opposed to merely speaking evasively or refraining from speaking at all or uh, using a broad mental reservation or something, outright lying, part of the wrongness of lying involves its perversion of our communicative faculty. That's another area in which the perverted fact of the argument is deployed, another area where it's very controversial. It doesn't just apply to sex. But the, the idea is that the analysis shows that these things are inherently wrong. So it doesn't matter what the... The, the greater good is that you, you seek to serve by engaging in them. If they're inherently wrong, you just can't, just can't do it. Um, so simply the fact that you know, some things might be allowed for the sake of higher end or, or, or for the sake of fulfilling some part of our nature, um, it doesn't follow that you know, anything might be done for the sake of some higher good. If it's intrinsically immoral, then that would not be allowed. Uh, yes, up there. Mm -hmm. Yes, you. Uh -huh. That's, yeah, you have that correct. Well, it, the question was whether um, with the withdrawal, using the withdrawal method for contraceptive purposes on the one hand, on the other hand, whether um, confining sex to infertile periods, uh, times when it's known that the woman is not, going to, is not likely to conceive, whether those are 
uh, morally essentially on a par, or whether they should be from a natural law point of view. And the difference is that in the, in the second case, unlike the, the first, the, the couple is not doing anything to interfere with the natural course of things. The couple is simply making use of what they know about the natural course of things, which is that women are not equally fertile at every point in the, every point in the month. So they're not doing anything positively to frustrate the, the um, procreative end of the sexual act. That's it, different from actively sort of interfering with the function of the organs chemically or physically or what have you. They're simply carrying out the act, knowing or foreseeing that there's a lo only a low probability or uh, maybe no probability in some cases that conception will actually result. But that's different from actually doing something to make sure that conception won't, uh, won't result. And that's what happens in withdrawal as much as it does in uh, using a condom or what have you. For, for what it's worth in the, 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 the alternative account of natural law that I have uh, presented elsewhere. Uh, these newfangled natural laws. These law. newfangled natural laws. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that you know, what not your father's family. natural law. <laughs> <laughs> not your great grandfather's. Your uh, <laughs> what you're after is the comprehensive union of spouses that is made possible, <clears throat> comprehensively, made possible by a biological union, which is the foundation and matrix of the multi level sharing of life biological, emotional, uh, dispositional, rational, volitional, and so forth by um, um, sexual um, complementarity. So uh, the question is, how is unity, how is that foundational biological unity effectuated? Well, it's effectuated by mating. Uh, how do you know when mating has happened or what mating is? Well, whether you're talking about deer out in the woods, the stag in the doe, or a man and a woman, mating happens when the non-behavioral uh, I'm sorry, when the behavioral conditions of procreation have been fulfilled. And that's why, historically, even back before there were any new natural law theorists, a marriage was regarded as fully consummated and therefore completed when the spouses had fulfilled the behavioral conditions of, non of procreation, quite independently of whether the non-behavioral conditions happened to obtain or not. Because as the farmer and the anatomist will tell you, Mating has been done, and you can know that it's been done, whether or not, and long before you know whether a calf or a baby is going to appear. I, I just want to add, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I mean, I, I, I think that's not, that particular point is not one where old and new natural law theory really diverge. I think that what happens, though, is when we get to, you know, criticisms that say, yeah, but what about, you know, isn't um, sex during infertile periods uh, on a par with... Uh, with withdrawal or what have you, you end up ha unavoidably, I think new natural law theorists have to do this too, you end up getting into the nitty gritty, the physical details, to such a point where the critic thinks, oh, all you guys care about is these physical details, which is not the case. No, 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 that's but, right. I mean, re really what you're interested in is biological unity. You're not interested in it just as biological unity, but as the foundation and matrix of a comprehensive union, in the same yeah. way that you're not just interested in emotional unity, you shouldn't be just right. interested in emotional unity. And all this, will be, all this will fall into place and be judged to be right on the basis of a set of metaphysical presuppositions. Now, I think Ed and I agree on that, although we might d disagree about what the metaphysical preconditions are. I mean, to me, the key thing is you've got to understand, it's got to be true that. If, it, if this is false, then, then my whole sex ethics thing is wrong, that human beings are not simply non-personal substances that are inhabiting, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, 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 or personal substances that are inhabiting non-personal bodies, but rather the human being is body and mind and spirit. The, yeah. the, 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 uh, bi the biological aspect of the self, the bodily aspect of the self, is part of the personal reality of the human being. So a truly comprehensive unity would unite people at the biological as well as the emotional and volitional and rational level. Yeah. No, I, I think we agree on all that. And as I said in the first part of the talk, you know, I use this analogy of a perceptual experience. It is, in a human being, radically different than it is in an animal oh, I because agree of the with conceptual that. element. Exactly. But that doesn't make it less than sensory. And so what, I was in, what, what, I'm, you know, what I'm keen to emphasize is that recognizing the unitive element in sex, 
does not make it any less procreative. And I think we agree we, on that. We, we do agree. And I think that critics of either old or new natural law theory tend to say, well, look, human beings are not animals. So in us, it's about emotional communion. Why are you guys so fixated on biology? And right. so and I'm we, keen and to emphasize, no, these form a seamless unity. In, in, I think that's being. exactly right. And, and, and of course, our response to the folks on the other side is, you know, when did you adopt Gnosticism? Yeah. Right? It's essentially a Gnostic view. And yeah. it's underwriting the whole idea of sex ethics that they've, that they've got. Yeah. Next question. I, I want to get some more student questions. And yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, epi oh I, ap ep I thought you said apostolic powers. That, that, that's, <laughs> came to the wrong lecture. Over you, that, Father Marty. <laughs> that's why we bring a priest along in case that question arrives. Episodic Episodic powers is what you said. Um, are there, and the question was, are there any ep other episodic powers uh, other than the procreative ones, say, and, and speech? Um, gee, I'd have to think about that. I, anybody? <laughs> well, eating, yeah, I guess eating is, a, is you could think of as, a, as an episodic activity. So we, we, you, you know, the meal, just like, a, like mm -hmm. an act of sexual relations, a meal is something you're not, you're not just continuously eating. You are, now, of course, you might be, some people maybe you kind of wonder if they're not continuously eating, but, um, <laughs> but yeah. a, a meal is a kind of episode. Now, it doesn't have quite the same sort of um, initiation and climax that the sexual act does. The sexual act might be, I'm, 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 I'm hesitant to say it's unique in that regard, but it, it might be. And the, the, a meal doesn't have quite that sort of clear, you know, beginning and ending, you might say. But it's a little closer to it than, than a lot of the other stuff we do is. That seeing is not episodic, you know, in anything like that way. I mean, obviously, you can close and open your eyes. And when you go to sleep, you close your eyes, you're not seeing. But for the most part, through the day, you're just seeing as one continuous activity. Same with breathing and so forth. And, um, and eating is, is, I think, less like that than it's like the sexual act. So it doesn't have quite the crisp sort of beginning progress and, and culmination that the sexual act does. Well, we're going about 15 minutes over. One more question back there. You've, you've been very patient with your hand up back there. Thank you. Uh, when did you your Yeah, so there were two, I'll take the second question first, and that is how, how natural law theory would deal with examples of intersex uh, individuals, right? So who have no clear, uh, their sexual organs are not clearly one or the other, male or female. That, that was the second question, right? Well, I mean, for, from the Aristotelian Thomistic natural law theorist point of view, all of those individuals are in fact either male or female. And in some cases, you know, there's a predominance, say, of one set of organs over the other that would, you know, give you a pretty, and not just that, but maybe behavioral cues and so forth that would, that would give you a sense over time which that is. But there may be cases that are, that are just simply indeterminate. But here as elsewhere in Aristotelian metaphysics, the, uh, the Aristotelian is going to argue on independent grounds that the indeterminacy is ultimately always epistemological rather than metaphysical. There's going to be a fact of the matter about whether any such individual is either male or female, even if things are so messy that we can't decide which. But that, that there, it's, it's, there's nothing in the natural law account of sex per se that uh, is the problem. There, that's just a general issue in Aristotelian metaphysics. And Aristotelian... Well, why does that have to be the case, Ed? I mean, in, in nature, why does that have to be? You get all kinds of things. Nature produces complete hydatidiform moles. You know, teratoma... Produces what? Na na nature does. Nature does. In other words, why couldn't there be uh, the, the emergence of uh, an individual that's, that's clearly a human being, but is not of a determinate sex. Not only you, you have trouble figuring it out, but there's just not determinate sex. Oh, well, I, I don't want to say that there, that there couldn't in you know, some possible worlds, as 
No, I mean, this, philosophers this, like this, to say. this one. I mean, the, I mean, nature produces amazing. You know, yeah, there, well, I mean, it's abnormal. I, I grant you that, but well, that's the that's the key thing. I mean, you know, wait, babies are born sometimes without. Are they babies without heads? You know, just stuff happens. Yeah, but in its natural state, the baby would have a head if you gave it. Yes, you know, I agree. You, I was yeah. about to say if you gave it a pill to restore, but it wouldn't have a head. You couldn't. Give it a pill. <laughs> but if you gave it a shot, <laughs> that's 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 well, open one. Oh. I guess you drop it in the neck. Yeah. You know. But no, I, I, I grant you. I mean, it'd be extremely but I mean, rare. But why not? But I don't. But but you I can't roll I don't. It out in advance is my point. The, well, I mean, let, let me say this: that first of all, you know, if we define human beings metaphysically as rational animals, yeah, yeah, there's nothing in animality per se that entails being either male or female. Agreed. So there's nothing in rational animality per se, in the abstract, that entails being either male or female. I suppose in theory there could be creatures that were neither male nor female, but were still rational. So in the metaphysical sense, they might be humans. But they wouldn't be the, you know, the species of human we are, I guess, because we, by our nature, reproduce sexually, and so we're either male or female. And as a result of that, since that's the, the normal case, the normal case determines what we say about the aberrant cases on a, on a background Aristotelian metaphysics, um, I, I don't see a plausible ground for saying that any individual human being wouldn't by nature be either male or female, even if in the nature of the case things were too many to say which. Uh, any more than we'd say that the baby born without a head in its natural state wouldn't have a head. Of course it would. It's just that we've got here a defective instance. Um, we've got a, a human being who hasn't developed properly. So I, I think we would say the same thing in the case of uh, someone whose uh, sex, male or female, was indeterminate from the, from the physiological plus behavioral evidence. I think we'd have an indeterminacy there, but it would be epistemological rather. Well, than I, I'll, I'll grant that you're right in the case of most intersex or people who are designated as intersex, I think, you know, as, a, as an empirical matter, that's almost, almost always, in virtually all the cases that I know about, just a question of one predominating over the other. You know, there's ambiguity there, but it, you know, your description would work. But I just don't think we can stipulate in advance that there can't be such a thing as. Well, I, I think that would, whether we can or not, I think would depend ultimately on the, the biological details. Mm -hmm. the bi, the, bi, bi, That's actually my point, yeah. And, yeah. So yeah. I, 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 yeah. The metaphysics I, itself can't resolve that. No, I agree, I agree with you on that, yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming certain biology, may, you know, metaphysics informed by what I take to be the biological facts, but I agree with you that metaphysics alone is not going to settle that. Um, the other question that was raised was, you asked whether it was, a, whether it was, um, could, whether a good ad hominem uh, objection to the sort of thing I'm saying might not be raised along the lines that, well, what I'm saying is merely the rationalization of Catholic prejudice, say, or of my you know, desire to walk on my hands or what have you, <laughs> while at the same time uh, defend traditional sexual morality. And I would say two things. First, no, you couldn't give a good ad hominem response of that sort because you'd be giving an ad hominem response, and ad hominem responses are always fallacious. So um, that would be the... That would be one answer. The other answer is that I would say you could give equally plausible, an equally plausible ad hominem objection to the opposite point of view. And I've, you know, I've had it happen to me. I mean, I'll give you, I'm not going to say the name, but a very prominent philosopher once said to me, it wasn't during a QA, and a it wasn't on video, unfortunately. I wish it were. I wish I had my cell phone out. I could. <laughs> but this person said to me that um, if the sort of metaphysics I defend really does turn out to have the kind of implications, the moral implications that natural law theorists say it, say it has, then that would be adequate reason to reject the metaphysics. Well, that's about as, as clear a case as you could want of someone letting their own so-called moral prejudices uh, drive their metaphysics, drive the theory. You know, you want a certain outcome and you're going to rig your metaphysics to get that outcome. It happens on it happens as much on the other side as it does on the, uh, the natural law side. So I think that's the other problem, is it cuts both ways, as well as being into the bargain, it's also fallacious. So. I find the interesting thing about that is that the actual utility of the ad hominem argument depends completely on who holds power in the yeah. culture, in the intellectual culture in which the, the, uh, the argument is being the arguments being yeah. made. So, you know, when you hear people say this, I mean, it's just a reflection of a kind of dogmatism right. that, you know, enables them to say things because it's what everybody else is already presupposing, and it's an yeah. excuse for not engaging in actually thinking and exactly. arguing. You, it's, it's choosing the sophists over Socrates. That's what it is. Good. Well, please join me in thanking Professor uh, Fieser. Thanks very much. Uh,